few weeks ago I did an unboxing of this Atari 800XL and it was sold on eBay as used. This key, the Z or the Z key was broken off. Uh, it's just barely holding on here and when I turned the machine on I got this. Which at first looks okay and then turns from green to red and that obviously shows that the memory is faulty. So today we are going to open this, clean it and see if we can fix it. Never ever opened an Atari 800XL. I owned one back in the day um, when I was starting collecting about uh, the year 2000. Um, never get around, got around to really use it. Um, it has a pretty nice keyboard I think. And so let's uh, open it up and see if we can fix this thing. Okay, I did unplug the machine. Um, looks Cosmetically in good shape, just a few scratches. Uh, this is sticking out here. I don't know what this is. Let's turn this around. It has one, two, three, four, five screws, and one under this still good seal. But on second thought, this is an actual Atari seal, but you can just flip it over and open it. So I'm not quite sure if this machine is really not has not been opened yet, but let's see what we have. Turn this around and pop it open and there should be some kind of ribbon cable I guess which connects yeah, the keyboard. It's right here. So let's pull this out. It's pretty pretty hard in there. It's an interesting way to mount a keyboard just by some rubber stuff I guess. And we have a metal shield which is screwed from below. So we have to take this out and okay interesting. So I thought that would be a simple operation but seems to be a bit more challenging, challenging than can't get this cable out of here. Don't want to break it because I know these cables are pretty fra fragile. So there seem to be two screws holding the main board in here. I will unscrew these. And these are the shorter screws, so this should go somewhere else. And that should give us access to the main board. I will leave the keyboard plugged in for now. And yes, this does indeed free the board. Um, really don't want to unplug the rim cable, but sooner or later I will have to do that, I guess. Man, that was quite some challenge only to get to the board itself. So here's the board and these are the memory chips in question. They are numbered from U9 uh, to U12 uh, 12, 16, 15, 14, 13. Okay little weird numbering. Here are the custom Atari chips. No, these are the custom Atari chips. Um, I don't know much about this board, but I guess my first attempt would be to get some replacements for these 426515 chips. And here's also a 426412. 
Okay, I guess in the last two digits are just the timing. So these are all 4264 chips and I will have to get some replacements and then this project will continue. So it seems that the Atari suffers from the same power supply problem like the C64 in that these are dying and over voltaging and then just killing um, RAMs and stuff like that. So before I put in new RAM chips I will test the power supply and interestingly enough the whole power supply is just plus 5 volts so you could use a USB cable to power this thing and maybe I will try that um, and replace the old power brick with a USB cable. I have the connector here so it's just a case of wiring this up. This is actually not the um, connector side but the um, female side on the machine so things will be reversed and let's just try and check if this thing gives 5 volts. So 5 volts should be on pin 1, uh, 4 and 6 which should be these pins and ground should be on all of these pins. So the middle connector is not connected. Let's see what happens. Yeah, 5.18 Yeah, it's, it's about 5 volts, so a bit high, but not too high to kill the machine, I guess. So this is good for now. So the power supply needs 1.5 amps, or the machine needs 1.5 amps max. So this is totally doable with a standard USB charger, uh, which has enough juice in it. But let's first replace the RAM and then take care of the power supply. So reading up on the internets showed me that there obviously is no connection between the dots on the screen and the RAM chips in the machine. So I did unscrew the machine and took out the keyboard connector and as you may see here this little silver stripe came loose so I'm, I hope that this is still good. I hate these ribbon connectors from the bottom of my heart. A dark heart. Um, so, unfortunately, the RAM is not socketed. So, we don't know which one is which or which one is dead. Um, I thought about doing the piggyback method. I, I have no idea if this works here, which means just putting on new RAM chips on the old RAM chips and checking what happens. I have no idea if I kill the machine with that, but could work. So since we have nothing to lose here, I guess we will so I do connect my wrist strap to a grounded or to a plugged in USB cable. So that way there's ground, which is nice. I also have no way of testing these. Let me quickly check if these are the right chips before we go on. And these say 426.415 and these say 426.412 and 15. So these should be okay. First, let's grab a piece of paper and create a raster of what's on the screen. And then we should see or should mark which RAM chips are marked as faulty or which blocks are red. And then we piggyback one of the memory chips on these over here and see if that changes anything. I also read that um, due to the nature of the memory arrangement, it could also be that not all of the RAM chips are dead, but just one and that takes down the test and shows very different results. So it may only be one RAM chip that is actually dead. Let's check that. And since there's only one which has a 12 on it instead of a 15, which is, uh, I guess, the timing of that chip, um, we might as well check the, the 12 one first. So. Okay, so since there are more broken than good chips or memory locations, by the way, every um, square on the screen should repre represent 1k of RAM. Um, 
and since they are more good than bad, no, more bad than good, I just did some circles uh, where that good memory or K of RAM, RAM was. And now we switch it off and piggyback one of these RAM chips. As I said, I have no way to know if this works, but what I do now is I put the chip on the other chip, which I could think of being faulty. And that has to be precise on the legs of the other leg uh, of the other chip, and then we turn it on again, and hopefully. That is identical. And that was chip number five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that is either okay or the piggyback trick doesn't work. So let's go ahead, pull some chips, socket them and put in new ones. Okay, let's first go and pull that very suspicious 12 chip and I did mark it with an X and let's go and get it out I hope some sort on one leg but this could actually work ah, no pulling traces shit that's not good so that was a close call as you might see that trace over here is a bit lifted so I think it's not broken, but it very well could have been. So let me put in a socket there and hope that nothing's, nothing's broken. So in order to get the socket in, I have to give this a little push down. Okay. Socket is in. Let's give this a try. So let's do this. Doesn't work without the memory, by the way. Moment of truth. Just one chip switched. Let's turn it on and see what happens. ready when you are. Yes, it works. Great. Okay, so that was an easy fix and it actually was the one chip that had a 12 instead of 15 here, which I guess is if there's a faster chip or a slower chip. I have to check that. You will see down here what it is actually. So let's put it back in its box and uh, connect the keyboard and hope it still works. So before I put the final screws in the case, let's just check if the keys work. Because I was a bit afraid that I might have killed. Looks good. Might have killed the ribbon cable on the keyboard, which is very fiddly. But all the keys seem to work just fine. Great! Since I have never used one of these machines, but I heard we could do a memory test, let's just do that. If we push start and switch the machine on. Now that didn't work so good. Uh, maybe it was option. Nope. 
select. Mm, not quite. Okay. Um, I guess if we type by. Ah, there we go. So there's the test suite in the Atari 800 XL. Ah, there's our memory test again. And that should work fine now, I hope. If it wouldn't, the Atari would automatically boot into memory test. At least that's what I read. Okay, let's take a look at the other tests. We have an audio visual test. We won't have we won't have much audio because the video cable only has component and no audio yet. But we are also going to build a fresh video cable with this little guy here. And that is as much testing as we can do now. Time to build a power supply and a video cable. Okay, let's start by creating a power cable and I'm a little reluctant to just cut off the connector from the original power supply, which is seven pins. And since the schematic of this connector says that these pins are all five volts and these pins are all ground, um, I'm willing to go a different route and that is to use a 5-pin connector because according to the Atari 800 XL schematics all these pins should be connected on the board. So if I just feed the bottom two with 5 volts that should work just fine uh, right here and two with ground and this is not used. So, so I should theoretically be able to use a 5-pin connector to supply the 800 XL with power and I found a nice thick USB cable, which I will cut off here, and then um, use this end with a standard wall ward, and this end will get the connector. So let's see how that goes. Um, in terms of soldering, we will have to solder on this connector, and since this is a view of the back of the 800, so that one, it's the same here. So we can just follow this and the two right pins will be 5 volts, two left pins will be ground. So let's do this and check if it works. Let's cut the cable. I guess we will keep this part. I know we can't keep this part because I can't solder like this. So we have to cut it right behind there. So first thing to do is to put the cap over the cable because that is a single point of failure on these cable um, operations. You forget to put it on and then you soldered the cable and you're fucked. Okay, since we only need the black and the red cable we will cut the others and then we will just do this. twist the cables a little. I got my connector right here. It's a little hard to see on camera. First we will put on some solder grease. As they call it on the pins we want to solder. And that should help. So we need the ground on the left side and the power on the right side. So you better not mix this up because that would be fatal, I guess. Let me quickly put some solder on here and Okay, I think we should work with some shrinking here because we don't want any shorts in the machine.
So since the pins should be connected on the board, I'm only going to solder two of the pins here and we will see how that works out. So I will not yet um, close this completely, but we can try and test that. So if this works at all, or if this works, and it should, we should see a red light. Grab the Atari. So only thing is, you really have to be careful because this also fits into the video plug. So always be sure to make this, to only put this into the power, so, uh, power port. That might be the only reason there are seven pins on this one. So this thing is rated six amps, which should be plenty. Let's put it in. Ah, there we are. This is an Atari 800XL running from a, power from a USB power supply, which is quite nice. And you can actually use a five pin connector for that. So let's finish this properly. Okay, perfect, nice. So that's all you need to power your Atari. Good, first cable done. Next up, we have our video cable. If we are going to build such a cable, we also need to add the Luma Chroma fix because the Atari doesn't output Luma Chroma by itself. So we'll have to do that too, but no worries. I got that covered. So, so what we have to do now is we take this um, connector and that is the orientation of this, but it's reversed. So ground is still on the middle pin down here, but audio will be here Chroma will be here, Luma will be here, and Composite will be here. So I guess I will quickly draw up my actual soldering diagram, which is ground here. Audio here. Chroma, Luma and composite video. So I have three cables here, no, four cables. Um, one will be audio, which is the white one. Then we will have Luma and Chroma, which will be the yellow and the red one. And we will have the black one, which is composite. So. That should be a multi-cable and it's plenty long and we just have to put together the ground cables and solder them to the middle pin and then the others to the other pins. So let's do this I guess. And as always before we do anything we first put the whole cable into the connector, whatever it's called in English, hull, um, to make sure that we can actually close the connector in the end. And then let's splice some more cables, I guess. Ah, okay, so we don't have to really check for what cable is which because these are actually color coded. So the yellow is a yellow, the white is a white, and the red is a red, which is nice. Someone actually thought about this. I like it. So I think what I will do is I will heat shrink the ground wires together and put just one smaller cable on that, which will all be hidden inside the um, connector. So it's much easier to solder this to the actual, uh, to the actual um, connector pins. And then we will solder this together, just like that. Thank you. 
solder from the other side too because it's not the most stable connection in the world. We wait a second for this to cool down and then we put the heat shrink on and then we have just one ground cable to take care of and it will, will be much easier to solder all this stuff on the connector which should be quite easy now. So let's start with the audio which is the white one. Put some flux on the cables starting with the audio one. I guess we have to put it on all the cables because once that is in there, the white one, there's no turning back. Okay, but I will also tin the connector first. So let me put some of the flux on there too. So we start with the white one. So we put one piece of heat shrink over there. And then we put the cable in. Nice. And we continue with chroma. So second one is in. And I will take care of the heat shrinking now because if these get too hot, they just shrink and they don't make much sense then. Okay, that's on there. Now we have the ground wire, which we will do last. And we have the yellow wire up and the composite black or silvery uh, down here, so I guess we will be doing the yellow one now. And now for the big finale. Now let's first take care of the heat shrinking maybe. At least put it in place so if it melts, it melts where it should melt. And that's on too. Nice. So that should be the proper video cable. Oh, and the pins melted, which is not good, not great. Ah uh, no. Look at that. Cheap old. Let's see if this still fits in the machine. Yeah, still works. Okay. Then I guess we are done with the cable, but we still have to take care of the Numa Chroma fix. So let me quickly close up the cable and then we are taking care of the rest. Okay, looks like a proper video cable. So let's try this and see what it does, if it does anything. By the way, pretty nice side effect. I have these, uh, I have these converters to SCART, so we can just plug in the video and uh, composite video and audio and have a SCART connector. And we will of course be using the freshly created power cable. and the freshly created video cable. Okay, so let's switch it on and see what it does. Okay, what we could do is we could run the test, the audio test. Okay, so we just type by, which uh, should theoretically take us to the self-test, but it doesn't. Interesting. So what happened? 
Let me quickly switch this off. Could be that the power supply is not strong enough to actually uh, provide enough power because I switched this to uh, one amp wall ward, new so power supply, or wall ward. Let's check it again. Okay, it's interesting. I hope this thing is not dying. Says ready. Okay. If I type buy. Ah, now we are back in the self test. So it actually had not enough power, which is interesting. So always use the 1.5 amp minimum wall, uh, wall watt charger thing on this cable. Okay, so let's try the audio test. Uh, Ah, look at that, there's audio. Nice, so we know video works, audio works. So about this uh, chroma fix, I found this in a post from Atari H or, or on Atari H. And this says to remove C56, which is not present on my machine. Um, then to lift right-handed C54, which we have to look up. And most importantly, to do the wire from here to the jack, because this pin of the DIN jack is not even connected. So I guess I will start with that and then um, go and check for C54 and see what it does. I also found this schematic, which is the top side of the board. And you can see there's also this um, connection. And it's also remove C56. Um, doesn't say anything, anything about C54, but about C55. So I don't know. And since I'm having an, a PAL machine here, um, and these fixes are for the NTSC machines. I don't even know if this works. So let's first maybe simply bring in a wire, see what happens and uh, work it up from there. So I will pre-tin the wire a little. And then the position where the wire goes is, let me quickly check. It's up here on this pin. Lay that the way it should be. And it should go to this pin, this pin down here. So there's kind of a U shape and we want to go to the last pin in the right row. Okay, that wire's on. Good. So, theoretically, we should be able to see something now. Might, might not be the brightest or most perfect picture, but let's Try this. Plug in the power. And the video. We should see a blue picture saying ready. Didn't blow up, that's good. And there we are. Nice. Uh, it's a bit distorted. There are some lines on the screen. But we have color, which is more than last time. Okay, that's uh, very promising. Um, so it was really simply doing that cable and that connection. Um, and now we could try to improve the picture by uh, lifting the lag on this 
um, one resistor. So it says here to lift C54 and if we check here C54 and that is really important because you can't make out most of the description on the board. Um, C64, uh, C, C54 should be the third, this green guy down here. And I have no idea if this is true. And if it was, we would have to cut the right hand side. We could even put in a switch to switch between Luma Chroma or Composite. So let's quickly cut the trace on this one. So, I mean, we could always saw it back if it was the wrong one. And let's see if it's the right one, which would be good. C54, yeah. Okay, so let's see if the picture quality got any better. Yeah, for my untrained eyes, this looks pretty much the same. So, uh, question is, can I still use composite now? Or is composite gone? So if we put in the composite video and switch over, now we get a black and white image. Okay, got some cable and a switch. And now let's solder that cable to that resistor. And let's put some heat shrink on that, like this. And then we solder another cable on the soldering spot of the resistor, which we just cut. I guess I will pull this video cable here, because my, my monitor is flashing while I'm soldering here, even though there is no power. but. Seems like the caps still hold a little charge. Okay, that is on there. And I will put some heat shrink on there too. Like that. Great, so now we will connect the switch. So that is a Luma Chroma. Now let's switch over to the composite, ah, which is also color. So okay, we I guess have a switch. Let me see. Um, if I turn this off and I, s and I flick this switch, what do we get? we get a black and white picture. So there's indeed a switch to enable color composite. But it doesn't make a big difference on the Luma Chroma side, I think. Let's switch back to Luma Chroma. Yeah, looks pretty much the same. I don't know if this is uh, the quality to be, to expect here. This is a color image, Luma Chroma. Looks decent enough, even better than composite. So I guess that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and bye-bye. Last word, I even found a way to mount the switch on the back side of the case. There was a cutout for the um, channel three or four selector, which was just taped closed by this little sticker. So I removed the sticker and didn't have to kill the case. And the switch just sits in there nicely. And the cable runs under the RF shield. So closing up now and that's it for now. This is Retro is your new black. If you are new to the channel, please like and subscribe. 
Thanks for watching and until next time.